Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the third of our uh, AI in healthcare rounds. Uh, and I'm very excited about our speaker today. And I'll uh, introduce uh, Christian in a minute. Before that, I wanted to say, as I said, this is the third in a, a series of uh, AI in healthcare rounds hosted by Hearsink. A school for Biomedical Innovation, and uh, we have so far uh, had good um, presence and follow-up, and all these uh, uh, talks are being uh, archived on the YouTube channel, um, so I hope we keep the momentum, and it's on the third Wednesday of each month at lunchtime, and I hope that um, in this community, uh, also the talk encourages other researchers to sign up to be part of this uh, in future uh, instances. Um, it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Christian van der Poel. He is a radiologist, um, currently an associate professor at McMaster Department of Radiology and Jurvinsky Hospital and Cancer Center. He completed a fellowship in abdominal imaging and intervention at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in, uh, at Harvard Medical School in Boston in uh, 2017. And uh, he's, he has a strong uh, cl uh, clinical and research interest in pancreatic imaging and hepatobiliary imaging with a focus on diagnosis, diagnostic test accuracy and research methodology and evidence synthesis. Um, he has recently also been exploring AI for medical imaging, especially LIRADS, uh, the liver imaging reporting data system. Uh, one of the many good uh, 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 things about uh, Dr. Van der Poel is that he is always open for uh, discussions and research given the heavy clinical workload. Clinicians are um, really hard pressed to do real research, but he's always open and uh, uh, excited to connect with non-clinicians and AI scientists to advance AI in healthcare. And he's a treasure, to be honest, in that regard. So I, without uh, further ado, it's 9.05, so hopefully uh, we are uh, not starting too early and most people are here. Uh, I pass it on to Dr. Van der Poel. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mehdi. Um, so I'll be discussing a project I've been working on for several years now, uh, deep learning for prediction of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, to start, uh, just a bit about myself. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm an associate professor of radiology at McMaster. Um, I'm also a radiologist. And uh, in fact, about 80% of my time is clinical work. The other 20% is uh, dedicated to research. Um, I'm not a, a data scientist. Um, I don't have a graduate degree in engineering. So I don't have uh, perhaps the same technical background as our, our prior presenters, um, but I think I bring a good clinical perspective and definitely an interest in this space. Um, and my prior research has mostly focused on hepatobiliary and pancreatic imaging. Um, I also do evidence synthesis research, pooling uh, data in uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, I want to start just by uh, acknowledging my team and really thanking them. Um, th this would totally not be possible to do in a vacuum. And uh, I have a great group of colleagues who have really uh, been selfless in giving their precious time to work on this. So I'm very grateful to them. Um, we have our team here at McMaster um, and then also the team in Montreal that we've used to externally uh, validate and test our data. Um, the first author, Umesh, in particular, has been phenomenal and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have worked with him. We're also grateful to our funders, the Canadian Radiological Foundation, uh, the Canadian Heads of Academic Radiology and the Hamilton Health Sciences New Investigator Fund which uh, helped us uh, fund the um, personnel and also the hardware that we needed to get this going. So just to begin with some background, um, hepatocellular carcinoma is a frequent diagnosis in high-risk patients. Um, and high-risk patients, uh, so these are patients at risk for getting liver cancer, are normally surveilled every six months on ultrasound in Canada. Uh, some clinicians will also uh, obtain a serum alpha fetal protein, but ultrasound is really the backbone of the screening. And to be a high-risk patient, it, it's a very specific definition. You have to either have hepatic cirrhosis from a non-vascular etiology, uh, chronic hepatitis B viral infection, 
or a current or prior hepatocellular carcinoma. And if you fulfill any one of those three criteria, you're then automatically at high risk uh, for liver cancer and should be surveilled using imaging. Um, we do these ultrasounds often in the clinics. We'll do them at the hospitals as well. If there's any abnormality on the ultrasound, a new finding or an unexplained finding, at that point, the patient would generally be referred on to get a diagnostic exam, either an MRI or a CT. And those are typically read using the liver imaging reporting and data system, which was created by the American College of Radiology back in 2011. And that's really the premier system for evaluating uh, these observations in these patients. I just wanna talk very briefly about LIRADS because it is um, a fundamental component of this project. LIRADS incorporates 26 imaging features on CT or MRI to establish a level of risk to an individual liver observation on the likelihood of HCC. There's really uh, five main drivers of that diagnosis though, and those are the major features. This is a table showing the major features, and these are really the key features we look for when we're trying to assign a risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Here is an example of axial T1 fat saturated images uh, through the liver. Um, this is a pre-gadolinium. This is after we've injected the patient with intravenous gadolinium, and you can see the aorta is much brighter than the other structures. And then here is a more delayed uh, phase of acquisition. What you'll notice on these images uh, is that here is the liver. There is an observation in the liver here that's kind of hard to see in the T1 fat saturated image. When we move on to the arterial phase imaging, you can see that this uh, observation becomes much brighter than the adjacent liver parenchyma on the arterial phase. That's called arterial phase hyperenhancement. And that is a feature that is independently associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. It alone is not specific, but it has an association. On the more delayed phase, you can see there's two features demonstrated. First of all, that area that was bright on the last sequence is now darker than the adjacent liver parenchyma. That's called non-peripheral washout. That is also a feature that is seen with hepatocellular carcinoma. And we have an enhancing capsule, this thin rim at the margin or the periphery of the observation that's enhancing more than the adjacent liver parenchyma. These three features are each associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. And when all three are combined in any liver observation over a centimeter, by definition, it fulfills LIRAD's five criteria. This is a very uh, unique uh, thing in radiology in that when an observation is labeled as LIRAD's five, it is diagnostic of hepatocellular carcinoma. It's highly specific and has a high positive predictive value to the point that that patient can go directly to treatment, including a liver transplant without the need for tissue confirmation. So it's very important to make that diagnosis correctly and it can have major implications for the patient's care. So our purpose was to develop a machine learning model that could diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma on MRI like an abdominal radiologist. And the purpose of this is to provide a decision support tool for radiologists and to also provide a tool for patients in regions that maybe have difficulty accessing radiologist expertise. We used a three-prong approach. Um, so first what we did was we uh, built a model to predict which major feature is present and which is absent are looking specifically at those qualitative features, the arterial phase hyperenhancement, the non-peripheral washout, and the enhancing capsule. We then uh, built a separate model to try and directly predict the LIRAD score regardless of those features. And these two models kind of approximate the likelihood of HCC by trying to predict that LIRAD score. And then finally, we built a third model that tries to directly predict if a liver observation is HCC not using LIRADS at all. Just yes or no, is this a hepatocellular carcinoma? This is a flow diagram of our inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. I won't go through it. Um, suffice it to say, it's fairly standard uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that we use that's seen in this literature. These were our data sources. So we used an internal data set uh, from Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joe's, and we used an external data set from the University of Montreal. Um, on our internal data set uh, and for the external, we required only adult patients greater than 18 years of age who had to be at high risk for HCC, again, either having cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis B, or a current or prior HCC uh, diagnosis. And at our site, we took all, uh, all scans between 2013 to 2018 at Montreal, uh, 2004 to 2016. Our cohort ultimately consisted of 485 liver observations from 129 patients. 
Of these, there were 206 observations that we could confidently say were or were not hepatocellular carcinoma. On the external data set, there were 275 liver observations from 102 patients, and of these, 105 were hepatocellular carcinoma. In terms of our data pre-processing, each liver observation was manually segmented in 3D on the DICOM format images, which was a pile of work. Um, we then used the UNET convolutional neural network uh, to do organ segmentation with a backbone based on efficient net. And we trained our data using the open source Duke liver data set. That's a little bit tricky with MRI because when you get an abdominal MRI, you don't just sit down and get one acquisition. You normally get multiple sequences acquired at different time points. And what can happen is during each of those sequences, patients can move, they can reposition themselves, they might cough. They usually have to take a breath hold during the, the signal acquisition. The breath hold might not be quite the same size as the prior sequence. And what happens is across sequences, you can get spatial misregistration. So you cannot assume that a voxel in one point in 3D corresponds to the same anatomic structure on the next sequence at the, at the same point you have to account for that. So we segmented our observations on only a single sequence and we developed our liver organ segmentation masks only on a single sequence, but we did a spatial re-registration of the other sequences to align all the, the maps and the observations. And we did this by training a similar network architecture to predict the optimal rigid body transformation. Just to sort of graphically illustrate that. So we took the Duke liver data set uh, you can see here's a, a T1 uh, axial fat suppressed MR image. Here's the liver, the brighter structure here. Here's our segmentation mask. And we fed that into an intensity invariant registration network. We then took the same data set and applied random affine transforms and random transform intensity uh, models to distort the images and try to give both translation and rotation to, to misalign the anatomy. And then trained this intensity invariant registration network to learn to re-register the images spatially. In terms of our data subsets that we included, we limited our analysis to LIRADS 3, LIRADS 4, and LIRADS 5 observations. And the reason for that was twofold. First of all, these are the most cl clinically pertinent uh, LIRADS categories. LIRADS 1 and LIRADS 2 are, are benign or probably benign observations and have no impact on management. The second reason was because the LIRADS 3 through 5 observations are directly derived from the major features table using that, that arterial phase hyperenhancement, enhancing capsule and non-peripheral washout. Some of the other categories are not derived from that and we, we didn't want to include those. This applies to the vast majority of liver observations that we see in practice that we work up with LIRADS. We used only the T1 weighted fat suppressed images pre and post contrast. We used all available post contrast sequences. So we didn't just limit to one or two. We excluded all the other imaging because it's not uh, used to derive the major features. So we did not include things like T2 weighted imaging, diffusion weighted imaging or chemical shift imaging. And we only included observations that we knew whether or not were HCC in that third model that was designed to directly predict if an observation was HCC. For the other observations, we obviously didn't know the ground truth so we couldn't use them to construct that model. In terms of our ground truth, so every MRI was reviewed independently by two abdominal radiologists using LIRADS version 2018. This was a lot of work. We had them review it completely independently. They were unaware of what the other radiologist had documented uh, each observation as. Um, what we did at our site is any discrepancies were then reviewed by a third abdominal radiologist who acted as a tiebreaker. In Montreal, they used the one month washout period where they didn't look at the images and then every discrepancy uh, was re-reviewed on a consensus read and they settled discrepancies that way. Um, in terms of establishing a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, we used something called the Composite Clinical Reference Standard. Um, so if we had pathology, either a percutaneous needle biopsy um, or you know, a resection uh, specimen, that would always be our go-to for establishing whether or not it was a hepatocellular carcinoma. In the absence of pathology, we used composite clinical findings that we felt were um, you know, highly specific for a diagnosis of HCC or not. So for example, if a liver observation was completely stable on imaging for more than 12 months, we regarded that as a benign observation. On the other hand, if a liver observation was a LIRADS-5, was uh, treated, for example, with a, a percutaneous ablation and showed recurrence on follow-up imaging, we considered that sufficiently specific to 
determine a diagnosis of HCC as a reference standard. In terms of our de-identification methods, so we set up an inter-institutional clinical study agreement with CHUM. Um, all DICOM format images were de-identified. So um, for those of you who haven't worked with MRI images before, um, there's patient protected health information embedded in every image in the DICOM metadata and that needs to be wiped. Now we actually kept all our images within the HHS network, but we still uh, went to the length of de-identifying that metadata to make sure no PHI um, was at risk. Um, between institutions, we never shared the images. All we shared were model weights and transferred the code itself to run the models. In terms of our data partitions, so we assessed our, our models using five-fold cross-validation. We used a single fold for testing, which was about 20% of the internal uh, data set, and the other four folds were split into 80% training and 20% validation. We tried to avoid class imbalances across folds by maintaining a roughly equal number of LIREDs category distributions within each fold. The other thing we tried to do was to avoid having the same patients represented in more than one fold. Some patients had contributed more than one liver observation. So, you know, a patient may have contributed two, three, even up to 10 liver observations in some cases. We made sure that those patients weren't represented in multiple folds to avoid uh, introducing any sort of bias that way. The external data set was similarly divided uh, into an 80-20 split. Um, except we used a single test set instead of five-fold testing. For our models, so the intensity within each liver observation was compared to the adjacent liver parenchyma to establish the three major features, arterial phase hyperenhancement, non-peripheral washout, and enhancing capsule. Same as a, a radiologist would do it. Um, we trained a standard convolutional neural network uh, to look for these three features using an efficient net. Um, and what we found initially was that the performance wasn't really great. We weren't very happy with it. And we sort of uh, stepped back and thought about it. And if you do think about it, I mean, and for those of you who, who may not, especially the clinical folks on the call who may not um, be as familiar with machine learning, a lot of convolutional neural networks are, are based on two dimensional imaging input. And many struggle to take very large images, you know, much larger than kind of 300 by 300 pixel type sizes. You need a lot more processing power. So many of these models run on 2D images and uh, have to kind of dumb down larger radiology images. And there's kind of two ways that you can do that. You can downsample the resolution. The other thing you can do is kind of use a patchwork approach where you just take parts of the image that you're actually interested in. And when you think about a liver observation and applying LIRADs, you start to think, well, what features do we use as radiologists to try and decide whether each feature is present or not? Where do we look on the image? And for a liver observation, for things like arterial phase hyperenhancement, we're really looking in the middle of the observation, not at the periphery. The same thing goes for non-peripheral washout. That's in the central part of the observation. On the other hand, enhancing capsule is a feature that we really look at the margin or periphery of the liver observation to get that information. So all the data we really need to establish if those three features are present or absent is all basically along a radius drawn perpendicular to the circumference, if you think about it. So we decided to try a, a new approach, which we called the radial line approach. And what we did was we deployed sampling lines that were perpendicular to the circumference of each observation. And we input those into a compact convolutional transformer. For the um, enhancing capsule classifier, we used the portion of the radius closest to the margin of the liver observation where that information is found. And for the arterial phase hyperenhancement and non-peripheral washout classifiers, we looked at the portion closest to the center of the observation. And then we, what we did was we compared a model using those samples to the efficient net that we initially used. This is an illustration of how that looks. So here's uh, two two-dimensional T1 fat suppressed post-contrast images showing a liver observation. This observation clearly has an enhancing capsule. And I don't think any radiologist would struggle to, uh, to identify that. Um, here's an example of the samples we took. So these are all radial. And again, we used the central part to look for arterial phase hyperenhancement or non-peripheral washout. We used the more peripheral part of the samples to identify the presence of enhancing capsule. So we took these samples, which are essentially one dimensional data and we fed those samples into a compact convolutional transformer to see if that could perform better than the efficient net model. Um, so that was for identifying the LIRAD's uh, major features. The other things we did was we built a separate classifier to diagnose 
or identify, predict a LIRETS three versus the other categories and another to predict LIRETS five versus the other categories. And then our third model was built uh, a completely separate classifier to look purely whether or not an observation was HCC. For all networks, we uh, computed binary accuracy, receiver operating characteristic area under the curve and EF1 score. We use the Krusko Wallace test to compare the five-fold uh, cross-validation area under the curves. And we used also uh, F1s and Cohen's Kappa to compare classifiers. And uh, when we, we then compared the performance to the radiologists and we used Cohen's Kappa for that comparison as well. So in terms of our internal data set, so for predicting the major features, uh, first of all, these were the major features that we looked at again. We found that arterial phase hyper enhancement didn't really have strong correlation with the other features. There was, however, some correlation um, between non-peripheral washout and enhancing capsules. So it's just one part of our data that, that we sort of discovered in this, you know, while, while we did this. Here's the two models being compared now. So here's the radial line approach model. Here's the efficient net based convolutional neural network. And if you just look at the area under the curve for arterial phase hyper enhancement, non-peripheral washout and enhancing caps. So we all were above 0 0.8. Now here's the 95% confidence intervals in the brackets, but all were fairly high. And overall the model performed much better than the efficient net where you can see for AFI, we were even less than 0 0.6 for area under the curve. So the radial line approach seemed to be working better. Here's an example of how that looked in practice. So here again is the, the liver observation. You can see all these radial lines. The dark red uh, lines that were sampled, the darker the color, the more that uh, fed into the predicted probability that enhancing capsule was present. So you can see the dark red lines are in areas where a capsule is really well defined to your eye. And, and really kind of makes sense that that would, you know, predict that there's a high likelihood that there's an enhancing capsule in this one dimensional data set. You can see here, maybe there's a bit of a gap in the capsule, the lines weren't as confident in that area. So the model was behaving in a way that was actually understandable to us and that we would predict it would. So how did this compare with radiologists? So R1 is radiologist one, R2 is radiologist two, and then this is radiologist one compared to the, the best model. Here's radiologist two compared to the best model. For all three features, arterial phase hyper enhancement, non-peripheral washout and enhancing capsule, we found there were no significant differences between the machine learning model and between the radiologists. I will uh, point out that the central uh, tendency points were a bit higher between the radiologists, but all the 95% confidence intervals overlapped. It's possible had we a larger sample size that maybe a difference would have emerged where the radiologists were outperforming the machine learning model. But with our data set, um, we, we found there was no difference. For predicting LIRADS category, so uh, we looked at predicting LIRADS 3 compared to the others. And then we also looked at predicting LIRADS 5 compared to the others. And both models, or sorry, the uh, radial sampling model did very well again. Uh, for predicting LIRADS 3, we had an area under the curve of 0 0.868. And for LIRADS 5, it was 0 0.946. So we were quite happy with that performance. However, when we compared to the radiologists, what we found was that there was better radiologist agreement for the final LIRADS category than there was between the machine learning model and each radiologist. And you can see here that the kappa was pretty good between the um, radiologists 0 0.8 and 0 0.78, the machine learning models uh, were each lower. So the model was good at uh, predicting the qualitative features, but when it came to predicting a category independently, it wasn't as strong. So now the big question, can we predict hepatocellular carcinoma similar to a radiologist? So here's the, the data. So here's our area under the curve again in this column, which is really uh, what, what we're focusing on. Here's the uh, radial sampling model trained using uh, the major features provided to it. Here's a freshly trained model for comparison. We kept the efficient net in here, and then we have the performance of radiologist one and radiologist two. What you'll see is the area under the curve for the two machine learning models was actually quite good using the radial sampling. So, you know, above 0 0.8 uh, for each model, which we were quite happy with, and very similar to the radiologists in terms of area under the curve. The efficient net uh, area under the curve was, was quite a bit lower, as you can see here. And that wasn't very surprising based on what we had learned looking at the qualitative features. When we compared the performance between the models and between the radiologists, 
we found there was no difference between the radial sampling model and the radiologist. So in other words, the machine learning model was able to predict hepatocellular carcinoma on a liver MRI using our internal data with the same level of agreement as that seen between two subspecialist radiologists in this area. So uh, things were working well in our set. We decided to now compare, look at the external data set. Let's see how well this model can generalize. Um, so here's for predicting major features. These are the areas under the curve. For the arterial phase hyperenhancement uh, feature, it was actually quite good right out of the box, 0.817. The performance for washout was not as good at 0.653. For enhancing capsule, it was good as well at 0.826. We did some transfer learning and retrain the data, and we saw some improvements, particularly uh, in washout, which came up to 0.861. So transfer learning really helped uh, with that feature. In terms of the LIRETS 3 categorization, out of the box, the models performed not as uh, well as we would have liked. So we had an area under the curve of 0 0.65 for the uh, LIRETS 3 classification and an area under the curve of 0 0.4, which is really suboptimal for the LIRETS 5 classification. What we found, however, is when we applied some transfer learning using a subset of the data, and retrain the models, we could significantly improve the performance. And uh, we were able to get uh, the LIRETS 3 up to 0 0.9 for area under the curve and LIRETS 5 to 0 0.89. So that transfer learning and retraining really made a big difference when we used a subset. Um, finally, for the HCC uh, diagnosis itself, again, out of the box, really uh, performance had really degraded on the external data set. So 0 0.451 and 0 0.364. Um, using the indirect and direct approaches. And th this may suggest there's overfitting in the model. We found when we uh, did transfer learning again, we were significantly uh, able to improve the performance significantly. So you can see the areas under the curve jumped considerably up to around 0 0.9 for each. So uh, what conclusions can we draw from this? So first of all, um, incorporating clinical understanding of pathophysiology can really improve machine learning model performance. And that was shown with our radial line approach, which made a big difference in the performance of the model. Um, generalizability remains a major challenge, uh, especially I think when looking at complex features. And uh, I think this is due to the lack of readily available high quality data. So, you know, this is not like a, a large language model that can scrape like 10% of the internet and just consume a ton of information. Medical data is all siloed, it's hard to get. And even when you get it, it's often labeled inconsistently. It's often acquired inconsistently. So it's very hard to bring that data together. There are some approaches like federated learning, but those remain a challenge to implement at scale. <clears throat> Transfer learning can substantially improve performance. So we took only a subset of our data and applied transfer learning and saw significant gains. We're currently exploring how much uh, transfer learning is needed to see those gains. How many uh, external data set uh, examples do we need to give our model and retrain it on to make it uh, more generalizable to the other uh, cases at that site. And finally, AI may be approaching specialist radiologist expertise for limited scope, but otherwise complex tasks. So this is not as simple as just looking for a white dot nodule on a black background lung, which is, you know, anyone can see it. This is a much more complex process. It requires understanding of hepatic uh, physiology and normal, uh, you know, vascular perfusion patterns, uh, HCC pathophysiology, and uh, general, general knowledge of MRI interpretation. So in terms of limitations or barriers to AI and healthcare in general, and, and for this study as well, there's a few things I should just touch on briefly. And the first thing is a lot of these studies, including ours, uh, admittedly is very task specific. So I, I think for, for models like ours to be to truly widely adopted, you need to have uh, kind of a, a broad range of, of uh, tasks that can be accomplished. This is a very specific task. I think it serves as a foundation for a bigger model, um, but that, that's really the challenge. And, you know, like we look at these patients who are at, at uh, risk for um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and many are quite sick, have severe cirrhosis. They, they present all the time with, you know, portal vein clots, uh, other issues, bleeds and things like that, ascites. This model accounts for none of that, whereas a radiologist can recognize that. Um, the failure to incorporate multimodal data is a big limitation with a lot of medical imaging, uh, artificial intelligence models. So, you know, it would be helpful to incorporate things like serum alpha fetoprotein, uh, child pew uh, classification for the patient, things like that, which have prognostic value. 
Um, currently, we, we base our uh, our model purely on imaging, but that, that's probably you know the next step. Um, AI can mislead physicians and reduce accuracy. And there's actually a study in radiology not too long ago where they uh, intentionally had a model give the incorrect interpretation on mammograms. And what they found was it could actually uh, sway the radiologist from making the correct call to the incorrect call. Um, so th there's, uh, we have to be careful with the adoption of AI um, and be mindful that you know, it's not always right either. Um, it can become less accurate over time from data drift. So um, you think about things like COVID, for example, you know, if you had a, a model that could interpret chest x-rays for pneumonia and it works great and that, that's fine, but then COVID comes along and we're seeing new patterns of pneumonia present, you know, constantly on radiographs, that model may not work so good on that new data. So data drift is something that has to be accounted for. My understanding of the FDA approval process is that once they approve a model, you can't continually, uh, continuously update it unless you're going to get approval again. So data drift is a real issue in that regard. Um, and then there's also the ethical and moral questions about liability. So, you know, if the model is wrong, I mean, it is, who's ultimately responsible? Is the creator of the model responsible? Is the physician applying the model uh, responsible? You know, someone needs to be liable at the end of the day. And, you know, I kind of, I kind of draw the analogy with an airplane. If you're going to get on an airplane, I mean, uh, you know, you don't need to have a pilot find that plane. Um, but most of us want somebody there who's, you know, responsible, has literally put their life on the line to make sure that plane is flown safely. It's kind of the same idea with AI in healthcare. Uh, you know, who do we want to be ultimately responsible in, in making decisions? So I think these are some of the barriers to the adoption of AI in healthcare. Uh, there's also the whole black box thing, which is common with uh, deep learning where we don't often understand exactly what the model is using to make its decisions. And I think sometimes physicians are a bit hesitant to embrace something that they don't really understand how it works. I think there are ways around that. And I think in our model, one example of that was how we use that radial, radial sampling approach to try and kind of guide what the model uh, was using. In terms of next steps, we're still uh, exploring the transfer learning analysis and collecting some remaining results. Um, there are several other centers that are conducting similar work to ours. We're not aware of anyone that's done what we've done, um, but there are other centers with segmented liver observations of livers. And uh, my goal is to secure more grant funding and basically onboard those centers who already have a running start with their data uh, mostly prepared and to try and build out our model and ideally incorporate more features and maybe even move towards a multimodal model. And um, yeah, I think we just really want to get more data and build this model out. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with a few resources. When I started this a few years ago, um, I had a really hard time finding people who had the time and the technical capability uh, to build this out. Um, and so, it, I mean, it took us a lot of time to find people to code. And we, we, we had a few team members come and go. Um, but we finally got to where we wanted it. And we finally found a great team. Um, and I think now it's a lot different uh, at McMaster and at Hamilton Health Sciences. And there's a few... Uh, resources that are available to all of us, and especially as clinicians who may not have the, the technical know-how to do this, um, to tap into and maybe collaborate with. And so there's the CREATE uh, Center, which is under HHS, and this is Dr. Jeremy Petch and Dr. Ashurbani Saha, who are data scientists and have really done phenomenal work, and they're totally integrated into HHS. Uh, you know, they, they know how to work with HIREB. Um, they've built models, and, and they're around, and um, they're always uh, you know, interested in learning about potential areas to collaborate and so on. So there, there are great resources there. And um, I would highly encourage uh, checking out the website. Um, Dr. Mehdi Moradi, who introduced me earlier uh, from the Department of Computing and Software Engineering at McMaster is uh, a you know, big AI guy. And he's, he's done phenomenal work with chest x-rays and he's certainly uh, interested in collaborating as well and has a lot of students. So if anyone is looking, I would highly encourage connecting with him. And uh, Dr. John Stokes, um, who presented the first rounds, uh, he's in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, but he's a great resource as well. Um, I think at the university level, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, there's a new Master of Biomedical Innovation. Um, so I think it's, it's a really exciting area to be working in. Um, McMaster has a lot of other resources too. There's the Innovation Factory, uh, which is free. Um, with people who can provide you with guidance uh, on how to uh, build something new. Um, they, they have no stake in the intellectual property of it. Um, it. It's set up by the government. So it's a really good resource, The Forge, um, and there's a few others. So 
that's really all I had. Um, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I would uh, be happy to uh, address them. Thank you very much, Christian. This was really good. Thanks for the plug at the end too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, this was this is good. We have time for uh, questions. If you still have time to uh, stick around for a few minutes. And uh, just as a follow-up to what just uh, Christian said, reminder that we do this on uh, third Wednesday of each month. So the next one is on October 18th. So sign up for that. And then um, I know that in November, I think we have Jeremy Spech actually, but I don't know who is the speaker in October yet, not finalized, but we have a lineup of uh, speakers that are really, um, uh, can, can give really good talks. So we look forward to the future events. But here, let me start with questions from the audience. Is there any, okay, Deepak, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, so thanks for having me here. I really appreciate uh, being able to be included in the rounds today. Um, Christian and I would have talked about this a bit and, and Christian, let me just say like, wow, this like blows my mind. I can't imagine how you went from here. I wonder if a computer can show us, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so I, you know, to go from, hey, we have people with cancers and they have funny things in their liver and I wonder if we could figure that out and how to do it. That's such a vague, vague, vague question. To go from that to this amount of work that melds what we know already with what AI can help us to improve upon or catch up to us a little bit. But um, that's, you know, putting that, putting the, the framework that you have in place to make this work is just phenomenal. So to you and your team, kudos. This, this is a massive amount of work and a lot of, um, of ingenuity, I think, um, right, out, right out of the, the box right, immediately. Right. Um, a couple of things. Um, when I started thinking about AI, you know, everyone kind of thinks chat GPT-4 and all these kinds of things, AI, that level. And you're thinking, oh, well, you know, you're just going to, you know, you'll see a referral come by and the family doctor will ask you, hey, my patient has a spot in the liver. What do you think? And you'll be thinking, well, hey, Epic, does this guy have an HCC? Does he have a, 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 a liver cancer? And you just wanted to say, of course, Dr. Dath, of course, that's a liver cancer. You should just go take it out, Right. Clearly, we're not there yet, and clearly, this is going to be a good bit of work before we get to that spot where people are using AI like you pick up your iPhone um, for this level of stuff. Um, but I guess um, uh, some of the questions I have with respect to the technical aspects of how you get here are like this. Um, it looks like when you set this up for this, for this project, for this uh, investigation, it was, a, it was on you to decide which cases should come, like you actually pick the cases first. And then from those, you had to kind of think, well, okay, these already look like they have these things in place. And then, um, and that's all, that's kind of like that we have to do for every, you know, um, every project to make that happen. But then um, one of the things that intrigued me was how you went from there to um, the computer can figure this out as to what we're looking at. And it looked like the 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 transition there was um, this process of using those radial lines, to, for instance, right? And my question to you is, who put the who decided where those radial lines would go? Whether there was or wasn't a um, uh, a spot to look at, and where the radial lines were being drawn, etc. And on which particular slice of the CT scan to be drawn? So all those other things that. You'd expect someone like a radiologist just goes, oh, let me just scroll to the film and boom, you know, you, you just, everything's there. Whereas it looked like you had to feed a lot of this stuff manually to the AI machine to figure out just what's going along the line. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. So um, th this, this project is really a classification project. We're, we're giving the machine, hey, here's, a, here's a, a volume of data at different time points. What, what's there and what's not, right? And so we we had to pre-process the images by segment, giving it, you know, here's the liver. We segmented the liver. Here's the observation we're interested in. We gave that segmentation as well. Um, and then using that segmentation, it could compute those radial lines. And it ran off. So what it would do is it would take two two-dimensional images, uh, either pre or post. One, one could have been pre, but at least one was always post. Um, and it would basically systematically place the lines there and we try to automate it as much as possible because for something like this to be embraced, it needs to be, it needs to be automated. Um, the reason we looked at the classification issue is because a lot of work has already been done on the segmentation issue. 
Um, uh, organ segmentation, you know, you just need an abdominal MRI or CT. There's going to be some liver there and you can use that to segment. It's not like HCC where it's, it's a much, you know, it's a small minority of cases. So the segmentation problem is being worked on a lot elsewhere and any publicly available data set of imaging of the abdomen will show a liver. Uh, the observation issue, a uh, segmentation issue is being worked on as well. The nice thing about uh, these models is you can actually combine them. So I think, you know, we're working on one very specific task, specific part of kind of a broader vision of making one day the autonomous model that does all this on its own. You just say, oh, I don't know if there's an HCC here. And you click a button and, and then all of a sudden you get a spit out. Okay, there's a LIRADS4 observation. Or, uh, you know, in this thing, and this is definitely an HCC in segment two, and this segment six observation here is a virus three and should get followed up. So, I mean, we're nowhere close to that yet, um, but I, I think that's the goal. We, we've tried to kind of dissect this down and focus on one specific part of that. And we've tried to do it in a, a systematic way where as much of our task was as, as automated as possible, just to try and eventually get towards an autonomous model. But it's challenging. I mean, there's so much data. I mean, typical abdominal MRI is over a thousand images. So all sorts of phases. Some turn out good quality. Sometimes the patient moves or the patient's uncomfortable or they have ascites and there's all sorts of artifact and it's non-diagnostic. And sometimes we'll be looking at the MRI and then we'll be looking at the CT from six weeks earlier and kind of using both to decide whether we think one of those features is there. It's going to be really hard to get all that into a model. And I, I think there probably needs to be several more technological leaps to, to get there. But I, I think that's where we're going. And I think in the meantime, we chip away at some of these problems. That's what we tried to do with the LIRADS classification. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see another hand up, but uh, please raise a hand if you have a question. I have one myself, uh, Dr. Randepo. So I wanted to ask about the... Uh, third-party data sets that you had that and the drop in performance when you go to uh, other distribution data. Um, and that I, I, I'm very familiar with that problem. It's not unique to what you're doing. It's always a problem, especially in healthcare. So the part that is, I wanted to have your opinion on is, why is this a little, not a little, actually quite worse in clinical, like radiology AI, as opposed to what I call consumer AI, like if you have natural images. Is it because we run like MRI machines at different data at different um, set settings in different centers? Is it because we have different population distribution of patients? I'm just trying to one I, I, as an AI scientist, I would say if we had access to data from multiple centers, let's just train the model on multiple centers at the beginning. But it's also kind of uh, I wanted like have some, some of your opinion about why is it that this problem is such a big challenge in, in clinical radiology? AI? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's a, I, the short answer is I don't know. The long answer is there's so many variables. So there, there's certainly differences in how MRIs are acquired. There may be different slice thicknesses, you know, different uh, echo times and repetition times. Um, there's so many things that are different. And I mean, what normally would happen is when you're setting up an MRI scanner, uh, you kind of sit down and someone modifies those variables to try and optimize the images. And sometimes it's done on a patient basis. Like if you're not getting you know enough signal to noise, you, you might tweak things to try and optimize that. So, I mean, I think that's part of it. Um, a big thing with, it probably didn't apply as much to our data set, but just, you know, in liver cancer in general is in Western populations, the big risk factor is, is cirrhosis. Um, historically from alcohol, I think it's moving more towards fatty liver disease leading to cirrhosis now. In uh, Eastern populations, um, especially uh, Southeast Asia, there's a lot more chronic hepatitis B, uh, which is a different process. And so, I mean, that that is something that in in the liver imaging realm, uh, when looking at HCC, that's something you would naturally wonder about is, well, are the risk factors the same across patients? A cirrhotic liver uh, looks very different on MRI than does a patient who has chronic hepatitis B, but no cirrhosis. But, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, I was thinking about this and there's really two things, right? Like there's one is these models need many examples, right? And it's hard to get those examples. It's just hard to get them in healthcare. And I think that's why healthcare lags behind some other areas with AI. Um, the other thing is, you know, when I have a, a resident or a med student or a fellow, I can show them one LIRADS5 observation and explain to them, you know, what features I'm using to derive that. 
And th they're going to understand that and they're going to be able to apply that after that one. Um, and I'd be surprised if you found many, you know, newly minted staff radiologists who just came out of training, whoever saw and applied LIRADS 400 times. I mean, I, I think that would be unheard of. Um, but, you know, so, so that would be a ton of data for a person, uh, a medical trainee. On the other hand, for machine learning model, the data scientists that I collaborate with say, this is all we have. We don't have, we need thousands or we'd like thousands ideally. And, I, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's ours. It's, uh, you know, it's people sitting down and spending their time doing this. It, it's very onerous. So, you know, I, I think it's a combination of needing a lot of models to, to or need a lot of data to train these models. If you could make models that didn't need as much data, and I know there's data augmentation techniques and things like that, but if we can improve that process, I think that there could be an improvement. If you can get more cases, and again, maybe the answer is federated learning, I'm not sure, uh, that could also lead to improvements. I think it's, I would argue, you know, you could argue, oh, well, we should be using the same MRIs and scanning everyone the same way. And I would argue, well, I mean, that's not going to be a very robust model then, right? Like ideally, I think it, it can strengthen a model. And you have way more technical knowledge than I do on this, but I think it's a strength that it can work across, you know, scanners, across um, a platform similar, similar to a radiologist could. I think that's kind of the goal and really a subspecialist radiologist. But, you know, there's all these factors. There's so many variables that can change. You probably saw there was a study done uh, looking at x-rays for pneumonia um, and uh, it, it did reasonably well. And then they tested it externally. It didn't work well. And it turned out it was looking at the, the markers that marked the side of the patient left or right. And the hospital patients had different markers than the, the community patients. And really it was just recognizing the marker because the hospital patients are more like that pneumonia. So it's that whole black box thing. I mean, there's so many variables. I mean, who knows what it's grabbing on? And when we look at the model that just directly classified HCC with no understanding of what it's actually using, I mean, maybe maybe it's using a variable that we would never consider that just happens to have collinearity or at least correlates with HCC. So it's it's a challenge. Yeah, I think uh, that's why I always insist that when we produce results, we produce attention maps and we really try to dig into what we are, what the network is looking at. Any uh, other questions? I see, oh, Dr. Deepak, you, you, you had an under comment, go ahead. So um, I have lots of questions. I just don't want to hog the, <laughs> hog the time for Christian because I'm sure other people have questions who are just being very shy. But um, one of the things we do, of course, in clinical work is we look at the pretest probability. We look at, hey, is this likely to happen before we decide, you know, in a fuzzy system? It, yeah, I believe that that's really what's going on here. And we can't always get perfect data. We don't have pathology before every Whipple operation, for instance, right? But, you know, I, 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 can, I can tell you that in the last 22 years of doing pancreas resections, that when we decided something required a pancreas resection, and we didn't have pathology ahead of time, about 98% of the time, it's a cancer, right? So, so we're pretty good at that by looking at a whole bunch of other factors that we can pour in. And I think that there are two things about that. Number one is that we understand, like you said, Christian, the physiology. So there are some things that make sense, and maybe it's important to throw the sensical things into the model to start with, right? So like you said, we already know that there is... Um, you know, um, peripheral enhancement and central washout, for instance, right? You know, you, you, the things you've seen, but there are other things that might make sense in terms of like, you know why it's going to happen in this particular, this particular sequence versus that sequence, et cetera. And those kinds of things may make a difference too. So those can be things that used to weigh the model to start with. It can kind of get preload things that way. Um, the other thing I would think of would be um, would be the contextual factors, right? So things outside of what might be there that others may know outside of radiology. So is there some way that we can use contextual factors that you can attach to that patient file that already, that for instance, already there in the, in the medical file that you can scrape and see, um, and those may increase your ability to detect some things. So um, right now, every single case you have there is somebody who has a high-risk HCC. Right, but if you want to, if you want to look at this, then you would have to look for the high risk HCC factors that are in the file already. And and I wonder if there are some other cases like this. Like so, if you step back from HCC and look at radiology in general a little bit, um, are there other 
and I, I, I hate to use this word, but other easier um, diagnoses that can teach us some more how to, how to focus on this one. And what I mean by that is, is there something else where there's a lot of other clinical information that's not on the imaging itself that you can scrape from the context and see what the AI is doing when it gets that stuff? And then see if we can use that same process or augment that process when you look at something more more specific like this or harder like this. You know, um, and I know the liver imaging mostly, and I'm not aware of that. But but what you're describing is multimodal models, models that take into account more than just what's on the imaging, um, and that that's really the the future. Um, and, and to get there, you need, you need that data to be available. And the challenge we face, I mean, even within HHS is that all the data, it, it's all in different areas of the medical record, right? And like, you know, I wanna see if the patients had chemotherapy when they've had it. Well, the oncologists use a separate database. It's very hard to pull all that data. And then when you bring in a data scientist who, who maybe has even less experience working, you know, going through uh, electronic medical records, it, it, it just gets even more complicated. Um, there are solutions that have been developed. I know the Ottawa Hospital uses one called MD Clone that they're quite happy with, which basically takes all the hospital data, like I'm talking like at scale, like all of the data, and creates a clone of it that's de-identified. And I mean, you have everything from vitals in there to everything, and it makes that data available, you know, to internal uh, uh, investigators to to then to build models and do things like that. Those are the types of solutions I think we need. Um, there's something uh, even a kind of a step above that, which is called generalizable uh, medical AI. And the idea behind that is that it incorporates multimodal data. It also incorporates patient, the patient's vitals live, you know, if they're in the ICU. It might recognize patterns that you're not recognizing as a physician. That, oh, we're seeing this, you know, this is associated with this in the next 20 minutes, you can imagine. Oh my goodness. Or, you know, and, and these can also, the idea would also be to grab the literature. So not only are you bringing in all this electronic medical record, but you're marrying uh, data right from the literature all into one comprehensive model. And that, that would be a generalizable medical AI model. That, that's the ultimate goal. But again, right now, the biggest barriers I see to this is just the siloed data. It's really hard to bring that data together. And in our project, like we had to pull all the images from PACS onto a separate server, it's still within HHS, but just that process uh, was very cumbersome. Um, I think we need to find solutions as a hospital uh, or as a healthcare network that really make it easier for people who have these ideas to kind of bring that data together, you know, in, in a feasible manner where, where it doesn't take, you know, you don't need a year of people writing custom code to pull it. So should we be having the ethicist on rounds here? so that we look at the patient information thing and should we be having some of the the governance people around here to say well absolutely you know, from the yep. yeah high rep you for sure need it right so because none mm -hmm. of these patients have consented for this it depends what you're doing so the way we structured our project was as a retrospective chart review and, and for that uh informed consent was waived um but if you're really looking at building kind of transformative models where you're starting to bring in data as it's happening live that's a whole other thing and, and it's almost like a prospective live study, right? And so I, I think at some level you need that. And I know, you know, when you have, you're doing a retrospective chart review with a few hundred patients, HIREB, the ethics boards, HIREB is great, by the way, I'm not trying to put them down, but, uh, you know, they're usually okay. When you start to say, oh, I want to take information from, you know, 20,000 patients, there, there starts to be issues can start to arise. And, you know, some of us have discussed, you know, would it make sense when someone's admitted into our network that they have some, uh, you know, uh, agreement, confidentiality agreement or disclaimer, or they're just asked, would you be willing to, you know, just across the board, everyone who comes through as part of their admission, uh, would you be willing to have your data used to build models? Um, and, and that's an idea too. But I think, I think we need, that's where we need to look, I think, if we want to push forward. Great. This was a very good discussion. Just, just to, if there's no other question, I would just add that in, like, uh, Doctor Das, I there are areas uh, that you have multimodal data. For example, in prostate cancer, there are er there are data sets of ultrasound, MR, and even the uh, molecular genetics data, like gene expressions, all together. So some some areas better than others, but as uh, Christian said, the problem is like. Uh, in one area of interest is usually not enough data. 
uh, the largest data sets we have are for things like chest X-ray, and that some of those are multimodal. Uh, especially there are things like at least you know the gender and age and things like that. So having at least a demographic information is not very difficult. But adding like other kinds of imaging or adding all kinds of like clinical tests might not is is really dependent on access to data, which is one of the challenges. Christian and I and others at MacMaster are trying to uh, deal with. I appreciate everyone's presence. If there are, I don't see any other hands. I am assuming that there are no other questions. If there are, let me know. Um, otherwise, this was a great pleasure to host you, Christian. Really insightful talk and good discussions. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you guys on October 18th for the next uh, one of these rounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.